Assalamu alaikum. Hello and good evening. This is webinar number four of the ACPN Patient Headache Series. My name is Gerard Moore and I'm the webinar support manager for today. If you have any um, private questions, you can contact me on the chat box and the admin only, and I will receive those private questions or comments um, that you wish to keep private. For any public questions for the speaker or moderator, you can post them in the public chat box. Uh, if you have any audio or visual connection issues, you can press the red reconnect button, which is located on your screen, and that will resynchronize your uh, webinar. Uh, the date today is the 19th of May. It's 7.30 p.m. here in the UAE. And this, as we said, is the fourth webinar of a five-part series hosted and organized by the American Center for Psychiatry and Neurology. They are being recorded and they will be available um, with ACPN at a future date for you free to watch at your convenience. For now, I would like to hand you over to the Chief Medical Officer and Chair of Neurology at American Center, Dr. Taufik al -Sadi. I'm sure you all know him. He will be the moderator for today and he will introduce the speaker and he will put forth the questions on your behalf after Dr. Deeb has finished his lecture. Dr. Taufik, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Gerard. Um, on behalf of the uh, senior management team of the American Center for Psychiatry and Neurology, I would like to welcome you all to our patients webinar. Today is actually the fourth uh, series of our webinars that we had started to uh, introduce all of you about managing uh, patients with headaches. Uh, it gave me the distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening program, Dr. Deep Kaid, a board certified neurologist who is well known in the field of neurology with his uh, uh, expertise in specifically when it comes down to managing patients with headache. Uh, today he's going to speak to us about a very important topic related to managing headaches in women in general, because you all know that uh, headaches are more, far more common in women as compared to men. So obviously there are so many unique issues when it comes down to managing headaches in that population. And uh, Dr. Deeb is the best expert who can tell all of us how we can best managing uh, headaches uh, in women in general. So the floor is all yours, Dr. Deeb. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us this evening. And after, and after your presentation, we'll open the floor for any questions related to your topic or any other topics that the audience may have uh, in mind. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Taufi. Um, I just need to share my screen. Just give me a minute. Let's try one more time. Gerard, I think I need your help. I'm not able to share my screen. And I cannot hear you either. Dr. Taufi, uh, hello. Dr. Taufi, you see the, the TV image at the top, the button? Yeah, I, I've hit that. It says yeah, choose then, what to share, but it's, but it's not then, showing what's open on my screen. If, if you Click on the image inside the white box and then click share. Okay, that's all right. And then click share. There we go. Okay, now we can see your screen, doctor. Now you go to PowerPoint, perfect. We can see, you can okay. proceed. Okay, very good. So thank you very much, Dr. Tofi, uh, for inviting me to uh, give this uh, talk about uh, women's issues and family planning in patients with headaches. Uh, as you know, um, Headache is one of the most common complaints, if not the most common complaint in outpatient neurology clinic, clinics, as well as outpatient GP clinics and in the emergency room and so forth. And most patients with headaches are women, whether this is migraine or tension type headache. So to manage headaches in women is the way to go because mostly women have headaches. Um, However, they are very, very um, common, and therefore you will find men and women in the clinics. Today, we'll concentrate about managing them in women. Before I go and talk about uh, how to manage uh, headaches and migraines uh, 
uh, with women-specific issues, I'd like to remind everybody of how do we classify headaches. I'm sure in prior webinars, and I'm not sure if everyone has attended those webinars, some of these issues have been discussed, but I think uh, I need to review them a bit again uh, before we talk about uh, female-related issues specifically. So headaches are usually classified according to something called the International Classification of Headache Disorders. So there's an International Headache Society that's made out of headache experts around the world, usually neurologists, and they have come together and put criteria for diagnosis of, of headaches. There are over two different 200 different varieties of headaches. And headaches are generally thought of as being either primary. Primary means nobody knows the cause. Medicine has not advanced well enough to know the cause. So 90% of headaches are primary. Only 10% of headaches are secondary. And what are the primary headaches? The primary headaches are truly migraine, tension type headache. There are things referred to as the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. Perhaps you've heard of cluster headache. That's one of those examples. And there are other primary headaches, such as cough headache and headache associated with sexual activity and hypnic headache and thunderclap headache and many others. These are the primary headache disorders, but the two most common, of course, are migraine and tension type headache. These are in contradistinction to the secondary headaches, which include eight different categories, including headache secondary to trauma, headache secondary to a vascular insult, such as a stroke or, or a certain uh, vascular malformation in the brain, uh, perhaps an aneurysm or otherwise. Also, there are non-vascular causes in the brain, such as inflammatory lesions and other processes that can result in headache, substance use or withdrawal, caffeine withdrawal, of course, is a cause of headache, infections, whether it's a COVID infection or the flu or a meningitis or an encephalitis can result in headaches, homeostatic features, what does that mean? Alterations in blood pressure, for example, is, is one of the most common causes. High blood pressure can sometimes result in headaches. Please do not wait for your blood pressure to be elevated before, uh, sorry, please do not wait for headaches before you check your blood pressure. Hypertension is known as a silent killer. It can be high for many years, and the first time it manifests can be catastrophic. And there are disorders of the structures of the head and neck, the temporomandibular joints, uh, the sinuses, and so forth that can result in headaches. And of course, psychiatric causes can also result in headaches. So, and some of these headaches, uh, it, with homeostasis stasis with pregnancy and uh, uh, with, with the substance use and withdrawal, estrogen use and withdrawal can also contribute to headaches. And we'll talk about this as these relate specifically to women. So I'd like to first start off by talking about migraine because migraine is very common. And how common is migraine? 12% of the population, including children, suffers from migraine. It says billion people worldwide. Three times as many women as men suffer from migraine. 18% of American women and 6% of men suffer from migraine and 10% of children. And these percentages have actually been looked at in Europe, also in our region with some epidemiological data, and it's pretty much similar all around the world. And migraine is most common between the ages of 18 and 44. You can already see between the ages of 18 and 44, this is the childbearing years, and 18% of American women suffer from migraine. So you can see a lot of issues with migraine are going to be related to pregnancy. And we'll talk about how to manage that, how to prepare for that, and so forth. But let's backtrack a bit. What is a migraine? I just want to make sure everybody here knows what we're talking about when we talk about migraine. Well, according to the International Classification of Headache Disorders, Migraine is a headache attack that lasts anywhere from 4 to 72 hours. So if you have a headache that lasts an hour or two and goes away, that's not a migraine. Now, migraine can go beyond 72 hours. We call that status migranosis. It's another subcategory of migraine. If you take a medication and the headache goes away in an hour or two, it can still be migraine. We're talking about 4 to 72 hours untreated or unsuccessfully treated. In addition, you have to have at least two of the following four characteristics. A one-sided or unilateral location, a pulsating quality, moderate or severe pain intensity, and aggravation by or causing avoidance of routine physical activity. You only need two out of these four. So the headache does not have to be pulsating, nor does it have to be unilateral. It could be severe and causing you to rest. That 
could satisfy the criteria. But that's not enough. You then must have at least one of the following two characteristics. Along with the headache, there should be nausea with or without vomiting. And if there is no nausea with or without vomiting, there must be light and sound sensitivity. These are the criteria by which migraine is diagnosed. So now that we know what migraine is, we know why it's important because a billion people worldwide suffer from migraine. About 75% of those billion people are women. If you look at migraine studies across the world for new medications and so forth, usually 80, 82, 85% of the participants are women. What I just spoke about was migraine without aura. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about migraine with aura because you may have heard this term. So if we take all patients with migraine, about 75, 80% of them have migraine without aura. 20 to 25% will experience an aura. And what is an aura? An aura is a transient disturbance in neurological function that occurs just before the headache or accompanies the headache. And it's a phenomenon that lasts anywhere from five minutes up to an hour with an average of about 20, 25 minutes. Now, most auras are visual. And if you Google migraine aura, you will get those exact same um, images that you see in front of you. And that's exactly where I got them from. So some people will see a bright spot with zigzag lines. Some people will see a fortification spectra, zigzag lines all over, or a dark spot that they cannot see through called a scotoma. Or there's sometimes more complex figures in there. This tells you that migraine is a brain disorder. There are disturbances in certain parts of the brain that give result to this aura. And following the aura, you will get a headache. And if, even if there's no aura, although the mechanisms are not fully understood, the starting impulse for migraine without aura, again, originates in the brain. Now that we understand a bit of what we're talking about, let's turn around and talk about gender-specific issues, women-related issues. Of course, there are hormonal influences. As this relate to the menstrual cycle and also to premenstrual syndrome, there are also issues related to the perimenopause and the use of the birth control pill. We will talk as well about issues related to family planning and pregnancy, how to manage medications before and during pregnancy, how to uh, interpret the headaches that are occurring. Are there new onset headaches? Is this a patient who used to suffer from headaches and now still having headaches in pregnancy? Or are these new onset headaches during pregnancy? And if they're new onset, um, are they something to worry about? Or has, been a, has there been a change in the character of the headache? And can we use birth control pills in, in, in women um, who have migraine, for example, or migraine with aura? We'll talk about some of these uh, issues. And hopefully there'll be enough time at the very end. I won't be able to cover everything for questions to, to address some of the gaps that I may not have fully covered. So let's first address hormonal influences. So the menstrual cycle is regular in many, but not in all. And the menstrual cycle relates to levels of progesterone and estrogen. And as menses comes on, there's a drop in the estrogen levels. Menstruation occurs and the cycle repeats on and on. We know that for some women with migraine, their migraine are menstrually related. We have two categories, menstrually related migraine and pure menstrual migraine. Now, menstrually related migraine means that the woman experiences migraines throughout the months, but more consistently or more severely around her period. And that occurs in at least two out of three periods. Pure menstrual migraine, and this is rare, I've only come across one patient in the last 25 years I've been doing this, are women who experience migraines only at the time of their menstrual cycle and no other time at all. So why do these headaches occur and why do they occur in some women but not others? Well, we don't know why they occur in some women and not others. We don't know why some women with migraine are sensitive to uh, fluctuations in estrogen and some women are not. Okay? But we know it's a fact. We see it always in our clinics, and it can help us a little bit in managing uh, um, the patient's migraines, understanding them better. Now, premenstrual syndrome is something that affects uh, a significant proportion of women, and premenstrual syndrome involves 
includes a lot of complaints, irritability, uh, mood disturbance, uh, appetite uh, fluctuations, uh, sleep disturbance, and guess what? Headache, not necessarily migraine, but headaches. And for women who suffer from premenstrual syndrome, of course, there are various interventions that can be uh, um, done uh, by non-neurologists, including uh, pharmacological interventions. And for the headaches, if they are not migraine-like headaches, then simple analgesics may be the way to approach them. Whereas if they are migraine-like headaches, then maybe this is migraines that are, maybe these are migraines that are being triggered uh, around the perimenstrual cycle. Um, we also know uh, that in the perimenopausal period, a lot of women with migraine experience worsening of migraines. So at the time when the menstrual cycle becomes irregular, there might be a sudden worsening of migraines that have been stable for many, many years. Again, um, there's no specific treatment for this except to treat it as you would any other migraine, but it helps us understand sometimes why women in their 40s, in their mid 40s or later, when their menstrual cycle starts to become irregular, that their headaches go out of control. I want to say a few words again uh, also about the birth control pill. Now, the birth control pill, um, whether it should be taken or not, and at what dosage, this is something that I defer to the gynecologist, to the family physician, whoever deals with this. I come into play when patients, women with migraine, need to go on the birth control pill. Now, what is the issue here? Studies from the 50s and 60s and 70s showed that women who have migraine and use the oral contraceptive pill may sustain a higher risk of stroke. But we have to remember a few things. Back then, birth control pills included high levels of estrogen, estradiol compounds, 50 micrograms, sometimes more. The current birth control pills used in these days usually have low levels of estradiol, usually less than 20 micrograms. And it is not felt that low levels of estradiol, it's not felt that these necessarily increase your risk of stroke. If we have to also look at migraine, this is women with migraine, we need to look at migraine with aura and migraine without aura. We said that migraine without aura is the most common. It doesn't seem that the use of uh, the birth control pill, the oral contraceptive pill, the combined oral contraceptive pill, infers any increased risk of stroke in women who have migraine without aura compa compared to women without migraine or with other types of headache. However, the story is completely different in women who have migraine with aura. And therefore, the use of the combined oral contraceptive pill is in some countries controversial in women with migraine. But please remember, it is not just the use of the oral contraceptive pill. One of the biggest complicating factors is smoking. And therefore, for my women, female patients who suffer from migraine with aura, who have a slightly increased risk of stroke compared to the general population, my first advice if they smoke is please stop smoking. Because if they have migraine with aura and they smoke and they use the pill, they really compound and increase the risk of stroke. Now, the risk of stroke is still quite low because at this age group from 18 to 44, the risk of stroke is very low in general. But it will be higher than the general population if these women have migraine with aura and they smoke and they use the birth control pill. So first thing is, if you have migraine with aura, please don't smoke. Well, everybody should not smoke but it's much more important in women with, who suffer from migraine with aura. Now, some women need to use the combined oral contraceptive pill. The, chance of, the chances of an unwanted pregnancy are much more disastrous to them than the, the minimal and slight increase in risk of stroke. And therefore, I am not against the use of the combined oral contraceptive pill in women who suffer from migraine with aura, as long as they do not smoke, as long as they are using the currently used combined oral contraceptive pills with less than 20 micrograms of estradiol in it, and as long as they don't have a high risk factor for high risk factors for stroke. 
What do I mean by high risk factors for stroke? Well, things like diabetes and hypertension, smoking, um, high cholesterol, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and so forth. There are many benefits to the use of the oral contraceptive pill, whether it's for contraception or other purposes, that it is not an absolute contraindication in women with migraine with oral. How about family planning? Well, we need to realize that headaches commonly occur during pregnancy in many women. And migraine commonly occurs in women of childbearing age. And therefore, not every headache that occurs in pregnancy is a serious headache. Most headaches are not. They're either continuation of previous headaches or they are headaches just related to hormonal fluctuations in the initial first trimester, which then actually settle down and there is a constant level of hormonal balance. And that's why if headaches worsen or occur, usually they do in the first trimester and then they are way less in the second and third trimester. And this is true for women with migraine without aura, especially not so much for my, women with migraine with aura and women with other types of headaches. Pregnancy is usually a time when women with migraine experience less headaches. Now that doesn't occur for everybody, depending on the studies you look at, somewhere between 50 and 75% of women will have improvement or near resolution of their migraines during pregnancy. Another about 15, 20% will have no major change and a very small minority, five or 10% may have worsening of their migraines during pregnancy. The other thing we need to realize is that sometimes because of the hormonal fluctuations, Women may experience their first ever migraine during pregnancy, and sometimes they may experience only auras. So we spoke about migraine with aura and those visual disturbances. There are people, whether pregnant or not, women or men, who will experience an aura without an accompanying headache. I just had a patient in clinic today who this morning had a migraine with aura and two months ago had an aura alone with no headache. So we have to be aware of these fluctuations. Not everybody with a headache or a migraine with aura during pregnancy needs to be stuck immediately into an MRI scanner to see what's going on. And on the side note, MRIs of the brain during pregnancy, even the first trimester, are considered safe. You may get conflicting information, but that's simply because some radiology technicians or radiologists and even physicians, neurologists, and otherwise are not up to date in the with the recommendations. There is no proof that imaging during pregnancy with MRI without contrast is harmful to the baby. So when preparing for pregnancy, rule number one is plan that pregnancy. I swear to God, if men had to become pregnant, the human race will be extinct. No man will, be, will, will get pregnant. So. We already know as well that half of pregnancies, if not more, are unplanned. So planning pregnancy is always the way to go, especially if you suffer from migraine. And we'll talk about why that is the case. So for patients with migraines and other headaches, we need to maintain a headache diary. That's true whether they're pregnant or not. The patient, neither the patient nor the physician will understand the headaches completely unless we maintain a headache diary. We need to optimize headache management prior to conception. Unfortunately, because of unplanned pregnancies or because the patient did not seek medical attention prior to pregnancy, we often see patients who are pregnant having severe headaches and they don't have guidance and they're very scared, they don't know what, what to do. Ideally, if a patient already suffers from migraines, they should be seen by their primary care physician or headache specialists to advise them what are the medications that they can or cannot use during pregnancy? How to handle headaches when pregnancy occurs? Um, how to control the headaches, whether with acute medications or preventive medications prior to conception? And some medications may not be allowed to be used during pregnancy. So all these are features that need to be addressed, hopefully prior to pregnancy, but unfortunately, very often, we are having to address these issues while the woman is pregnant because no planning was done previous to that. So what happens to headaches during pregnancy? I already touched on that a bit. The hormonal changes can cause worsening of headaches in the first trimester, but 
for many women, the headaches go away. New onset headaches in the third trimester should be closely looked at because sometimes they may herald serious underlying causes, such as eclampsia or preeclampsia, such as brain vascular malformations that can manifest during the latter part of pregnancy. So these are things that if a patient, if a woman experiences severe headaches or new onset headaches during the third trimester, assessment by a neurologist is of paramount importance in order to rule out serious underlying causes. And also imaging is the easiest way to exclude things if uh, there is a reason to do so. Um, and again, there's no worry about using um, MRIs uh, throughout pregnancy. So why? Why do people get headaches during pregnancy? Well, the patient may not be getting enough sleep. And these are not just for pregnancy. I mean, these are also triggers for headaches in women with migraine in general. Uh, but they are also much more prevalent and prominent during pregnancy. So not getting enough sleep. Caffeine withdrawal may sometimes um, uh, trigger um, uh, migraines. And let me just say a few words about caffeine because caffeine confuses a lot of people. Now, first of all, it is very rare that caffeine is a migraine trigger. I've had one patient, again, who, who's, who's always, who, who, who came to me and said that anytime they had anything caffeinated, they would get a headache. That is the exception to the rule. What mostly happen, happens is that somebody is used to taking caffeine. They're caffeine dependent. And for one reason or another, they withdraw caffeine, whether they're pregnant or not. And it's caffeine withdrawal that actually precipitates a headache, migraineous or otherwise. Dehydration is also a known trigger for headaches during pregnancy. Stress is a very common trigger for headaches, pregnancy or otherwise. And if you have comorbid depression or anxiety, and I believe the fifth lecture in the series uh, uh, on, on headaches by the American Center of Psychiatry and Neurology will be addressing um, management of headaches in uh, patients with psychiatric conditions such as depression and anxiety. So all of these things can be triggers or causes of headaches during pregnancy, not to mention already the hormonal fluctuations that we spoke about. So how do we treat headaches during pregnancy and what drug to use? So you're a woman who either has pre-existing headaches or now has new onset headaches that we have determined are not serious. How do we treat them during pregnancy? Which drug should we use? Which drug is safest for the mother and safest, of course, for the baby? And which are okay and not okay to use? Well, before we talk about which drugs are okay or not so okay to use, we need to use non-drug interventions. So, number one, avoid any triggers. If you already suffer from migraines or headaches and you know that there are certain triggers such as too much or too little sleep, skipping meals, stress and so much, avoid these triggers. Keep a predictable schedule of meals and snacks, regular eating habits, try not to skip meals. Make sure you're well hydrated, get plenty of rest. Now that might be tough if you're pregnant and you have a full-time job and you have children at home and you have all the responsibility, it's easier said than done. However, if you're a patient who suffers from migraines, Patients with migraines, their brain is very sensitive to any type of change, change in weather, change in sleep habits, change in food, sleep, change in stress levels, and therefore rest sometimes is necessary, otherwise patients will suffer. Consider taking a class in biofeedback or other relaxation techniques. Now, relaxation techniques may be sitting in the mosque and reading the Quran or going to church and uh, praying to Jesus, maybe going up to Tibet and talking to the Hindu gods. I don't know what it is. Everybody has his own way of relaxing, yoga, meditation, and biofeedback. You need to find whatever works for you, and you need to do it. But when the pain strikes, what are you going to do? Well, you can do things such as using ice packs, using massage, resting in a quiet and darkened room. Some women have found uh, acupuncture to be useful, uh, some women not. But these are the things that you can try and do to try and minimize the impact of the headache. Now, how about medication? So you've done all that, and now you're pregnant and you're getting these headaches. What can you do? 
how can you get rid of these headaches? You've tried these ice packs, you've tried meditation, you've taken a day off work, you're trying to rest, and these headaches just won't go away. What do you do? Well, this is when we have to go back to what we do as physicians, prescribing medications to some part. And medications can be thought of as two different categories. Acute medications, and acute means you have a headache, you take something. You don't have a headache, you don't take something. And preventive medications. And preventive medications, the aim of preventive medications is to reduce the frequency and the severity of headaches. Let me first say a few words about preventive medications before I speak about acute medications. So when it comes to preventive medications, we really do not usually start patients who are pregnant on preventive medications. This is not the time to start preventive medication. It is pre-pregnancy that you should optimize preventive medications. And you need to realize that many preventive medications cannot be used during pregnancy. For example, topiramate, which is an anti-seizure medication used for migraine prevention, is contraindicated in, pre in pregnancy because it causes a certain uh, increased risk of cleft lip and cleft palate. Valproic acid, Depakine, another anti-seizure medication, is absolutely contraindicated in women, uh, pregnant or not, actually, because even if they have just the potential of becoming pregnant, because they have a 10% chance of... Uh, of, of uh, major congenital malformations and low IQs in the babies and so forth. Other medications also pose, prob pose problems. Some of the safer medications for prevention include beta blockers, things like propranolol. And I've had patients who have uh, severe migraines and could not really stop their preventive medications and needed to become pregnant. And we kept them on some of these preventive medications, such as propranolol. Another one is amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant. It's a very old antidepressant medication that we do not use anymore for the treatment of depression. It is also thought to be relatively safe in pregnancy. But apart from these two medications, most other medications are contraindicated in pregnancy or have to be used on a um, uh, benefit to risk ratio. For some women with chronic migraine who use onobotulinum toxin, Botox, for treatment of their chronic migraines, although the label says that Botox is contraindicated uh, uh, during pregnancy, there are some places in the world where patients are maintained on Botox during pregnancy. And usually these are patients that have previously failed everything, have responded well to botulinum toxin. Now they decide that they want to become pregnant and stopping the botulinum toxin would be just suicide because their headaches will go out of control. And botulinum toxin is injected locally. So there is plenty of um, data uh, to support its use during pregnancy. However, this is a shared decision between physician and patient. So that's what I wanted to say about preventive medications. Yeah? We have a new class of preventive medications, uh, and these are great medications. Actually, the first one came to the market in the U.S. Uh, three years ago this month, in May 2018. Uh, it arrived in the UAE in October, end of October 2018, and I had the privilege of administering it uh, to one of the first patients in the entire region when it arrived here. Uh, since then, there are four such agents approved in the U.S., two of which are now available in the UAE, and one will be available by the end of this year, and a third one will be available by the end of this year. Now, these medications, unfortunately, are contraindicated in pregnancy and should be stopped at least four to five months prior to conception. So as good as they are, they're really not very uh, uh, useful um, to us if a woman decides to become pregnant. And remember, most of our patients with migraine are women in the childbearing age, and 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. Now, there are there is some good news, is that these are very large molecules, and that in the initial parts of pregnancy, they do not cross the placenta, and they will not cause harm to the baby. However, the official, um, the official recommendation is that if you're planning to become pregnant, you cannot be on those types of medication. So, but let's say the patient does not require a preventive medication. How about acute medications? What can a woman who is pregnant use for treatment of her migraines? Paracetamol is generally thought of as being safe. Before pregnancy, during pregnancy, after pregnancy, whenever. So that's usually a safe medication. How about ibuprofen? 
Ibuprofen belongs to a class of medication called the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these include medications such as ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, ponstan, um, aterococcib, uh, also includes things like diclofenac, um, mobic, and many others. These medications are contraindicated during the first and third trimester because they have been associated with certain fetal abnormalities during those two trimesters. However, they are considered safe during the second trimester. And so if I have a woman who is pregnant who continues to have headaches during the second trimester, I have no problems in recommending the use of as needed non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen or naproxen during the second um, trimester of pregnancy. I believe that the stress of severe headache to the woman and the baby outweighs the potential risks, minimal as they may be, of the medications we're discussing in their spe specific indication during pregnancy. With acute medications, we have general painkillers, and we mentioned paracetamol, and we mentioned the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But we also have migraine-specific medications. Now, the most well-known of those were marketed and, and came into use in the mid-1990s, and they represented a revolution of care for patients with migraine. Patients who'd been suffering for decades suddenly got medications that worked like, worked like magic. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't work for everybody. And these medications are called triptans. So we have sumatriptan and elitriptan and naratriptan and zolmitriptan and risatriptan. You may have heard the brand names such as Imigran, Maxal, Zomig, Relpax. These all belong to a class of medications called triptans. They work via a very specific mechanism in the brain. They work on uh, a class of receptor called the serotonin 1BD receptors, and they're migraine specific. They don't work for everybody, but they do work for a large percentage of patients with migraine. And if you look at the package insert of these medications, you will see that they are their use is contraindicated during pregnancy. They simply cannot be used during pregnancy. And that is true of all new medications because they are never tested in pregnancy. However, if we look at Scandinavian, especially Norwegian registries, we'll find that sumatriptan, the first one of those medications to come out, immigrant, and naratriptan, naramic, have not really been associated with any congenital birth defects or problems of the sort. And therefore, I now, for the past two to three years, have no problems recommending the use of sumatriptan specifically and naratriptan as well during pregnancy for women who only respond to these types of medications or who are not responding to other simple analgesics such as paracetamol or ibuprofen. And these are specifically for migraines. We have two new classes of acute medications um, just approved in the US about one and a half years ago and one year and two months ago called DITANS and called uh, GPANS. Um, Dubai and the UAE, always aiming to bring new medications to the market, now have brought these medications over here. We've had for the past couple of months availability of a DITAN called uh, Lasmiditan or Reva. And um, next month, I believe, or at the latest, the mo one month later, we will have access to another medication under the GPAN family called Remigipant or Nurtec. Now, these are, again, migraine-specific medications, but, of course, they will be contraindicated in pregnancy and we'll have to wait for years and years and years of accidental pregnancies to occur and registries to show us whether these things are safe or not safe during uh, pregnancy. Okay, so I think um, this is all I wanted to discuss in relation to the um, management of headaches and migraines as they relate to women and hormonal fluctuations and cycles and pregnancy planning and so forth. And uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions, uh, if there are any. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deep, for this uh, informative uh, discussion about managing headaches in women. I'm sure we'll have so many questions will be coming up in the coming minutes. But uh, let me ask you this qu quick question, uh, Dr. Kayed. Um, I'm sure you face that all the time in your clinic. Uh, you know, women with history of migraine, is planning to get pregnant and she will ask you that question what are the chances for my migraines to get worse or the chances of my my migraines remain the same or even getting better if i become pregnant so how would you best respond to her 
the second question that I, I'm sure she will ask you as well, is there any prognostic factors that would tell you as Dr. Kayed that I will do well versus I may not do that well if I become pregnant? Okay, so let, let me address the first question. Um, there are studies there with variable uh, statistics, but somewhere between half and three quarters of patients who suffer from migraine, of women who suffer from migraine, will have near or complete resolution of their migraines during pregnancy. So that's a good news for a lot of women with migraine, up to three quarters. In the first, in the first trimester, there may be some fluctuations, but by the end of the first trimester, almost 50 to 75% of women will have complete resolutions of their headaches and migraines. That leaves about 25%. Perhaps 15% of those women will not experience any improvement, but also no worsening of their migraines, and they will continue to have migraines on and off during pregnancy. And there is five or 10%, there are five or 10% of patients whose migraines actually worsen during pregnancy. And as I had mentioned earlier, there are women who've never had migraines and they experience their first ever migraine during pregnancy, whether it's migraine with aura or even isolated aura. So all these scenarios are possible. The majority of women with migraine can expect improvement of their migraines during pregnancy, but not all. Now, when it comes to prognostication, will I be able to tell whether this woman will or will not have improvement in her migraines? Women who have migraine without aura tend to do better. Women whose migraines are menstrually related tend to do better to a larger extent than women who suffer from migraine with aura. Women who suffer from migraine with aura still a substantial proportion do get improvement, but not as many when you compare it to those without aura. Thank you, Dr. Kidna. I'm seeing uh, questions are com coming. One of the good questions that um, we are receiving related to an area that you haven't touched much uh, during your presentation related to uh, having headaches during menopause. What will happen during menopause? Would the okay. headaches become better or worse or what? All right, so I talked about the perimenopause, you know, around that time. Uh, that's a time of hormonal fluctuation. And that's a time for most women with migraine when their migraines get worse, okay? Now the good news, the good news is that for most women, when menopause hits, their headaches will go away, but not for everybody. Yeah. There's a question about uh, taking medications and its effect on uh, uh, menstrual cycle. So they did not specify whether it is acute medications or uh, preventive treatment. But the question is, it does it affect your hormonal cycle? Um, so acute medications, so we're talking about paracetamol or ibuprofen-like medications or triptan, such as sumatriptan, uh, and, and the other related medications should not affect the menstrual cycle. So acute medications usually don't. Now, when we come to preventive medications, they might. You know, um, remember, preventive medications are usually medicines, well, traditionally, they've been medicines used for other indications, such as depression, such as epilepsy, such as blood pressure control and heart disease. Now, those medications, if you look at their side effect profile, some of them can result in menstrual irregularities, whether they're the tricyclics or the anti-epilepsy medications. But as a rule, no. Okay. So if you are taking those medications and you experience a disturbance in your menstrual cycle, then you need to go back to your gynecologist or to the endocrinologist and investigate that and make sure that there's no other cause for it. When it comes to the new preventive medications, which are the uh, we call them the monoclonal antibodies, the large molecule uh, CGRP antagonists, uh, which, uh, which, which have really revolutionized the care of migraine for prevention uh, since they came out three years ago. Now, those are not associated, to the best of my knowledge, with menstrual irregularities either. They're very easy to use medications, once monthly injections. Not really, you can't really use them if you plan to become pregnant, as we said, but they should not be associated with menstrual irregularities. Right. And, and by the way, Dr. Tofik, may I add that it has not been found that a diagnosis of migraine makes it more or less difficult for the woman to become pregnant. And it has not been found that a diagnosis of migraine, with or without aura, has any negative connotations to pregnancy, except for sometimes a, a earlier, a earlier uh, date of delivery, but nothing else. Uh, very good. Um, we're having some questions related to the use of supplements. I guess they are referring to 
uh, vitamins and herbs, etc., in managing headaches. They do not specif specify if during pregnancy or outside the pregnancy state, but if you want to comment on this, please. Okay. So, um, in general, I will say uh, my comments will be outside of pregnancy. So, and they actually apply to both women and men. So, uh, some patients are resistant to taking medications, which is fine. So we have an option to try um, supplements and vitamins. There is some data, some good data, to support the use of certain supplements and vitamins. Like what? For example, um, there's no specific data to say vitamin B12 or vitamin D supplementation is good. We see a lot of people on these supplements, but there's no specific data when it relates to migraine. The specific data actually relates to magnesium. And when we talk about magnesium, you really should, the studies that have shown benefit have shown benefits with magnesium at a dose of 600 milligrams a day. So taking one pill of magnesium uh, of 150 milligrams daily is unlikely to show any benefit. And I find that supplements really mostly work if they're going to work in patients with very mild migraines. Once you get the more severe migraines that usually bring patients to come and see us, uh, those supplements and vitamins do not work uh, very well. Other uh, vitamins that can be uh, used sometimes is riboflavin, vitamin B2. Um, that's also been shown to show some benefit. Some people have shown some benefit with using omega. Um, there are other herbal stuff. Um, I usually tell patients that these things are in general harmless, but you have to use them for a certain period of time you have to maintain a headache diary. You have to see whether there's a response. And if there is, great, you can continue them. And if there isn't, please stop them. There's no need to take supplements and vitamins indefinitely uh, just because you think they may be helpful for your migraines. Very good. Uh, along the same lines, there are some questions related to the use of biofeedback, although that in the last series we have addressed the, the issue of biofeedback and uh, in managing headaches in general, but if you want to comment on the biofeedback technique in managing headaches, specifically migraines in general. Okay, so uh, biofeedback, uh, I, I do not claim to be an expert in biofeedback, but if you remember, uh, stress is one of the most common um, um, triggers for headaches, whether they are migraines or tension type headaches. And biofeedback can help you understand a little bit more about the, the, the stress in your neck muscles, the, stre the stress in your scalp, uh, and give you objective measures of you invol involuntarily tensing up of what your heart rate is. And if you can concentrate on these factors and bring them down, that can always have a positive effect on reducing the stress. And given that stress is a trigger, if you reduce stress, hopefully you will get less severe and less frequent and less intense headaches. Um, there is a question that uh, I've tried yoga uh, for uh, my migraines and it did not work. So if you'd like to comment on this. Yeah, well, uh, nothing works for everybody. Yeah, nothing works for everybody. So I'm not surprised. Um, with severe headaches, these things help, but they're usually not sufficient in of, in of, and of themselves. So it's not surprising uh, if yoga cured migraines or helped everybody's migraines. Um, I'd surely be happy. The pharmaceutical industry would not be, yeah. But uh, nothing works for everybody. So you try, and uh, medicine has not advanced enough for me to hold a scanner, go it over your, you know, send it over your body, and tell you you're going to benefit from yoga, you're going to benefit from coenzyme Q along with magnesium, and you're going to benefit from sumatriptan, and you're going to benefit from ibuprofen. We know that these medications work for patients with migraine, but we don't know exactly which one works for which patient. And it's a trial and error, a, a, a calculated and educated trial and error by knowing the um, benefits of the medication, by knowing the risks and the side effects of the medications or the other intervention. We haven't touched upon, you know, we talked about biofeedback and yoga. We haven't touched about non-pharmacological ways of intervention. There are things called transmagnetic stimulation using magnetic fields. We can use uh, handheld uh, stimulators to stimulate the vagus nerve, external uh, vagus nerve stimulation. We can use supraorbital nerve stimulation and occipital nerve stimulation. We can use uh, in pregnancy, for example, for patients with severe headaches, we can use injections to the occipital nerves called ox greater occipital nerve blocks. 
Um, these are usually uh, accepted and tolerated during pregnancy to abort severe migraines. So we have a lot of things that we can do depending on the specific clinical scenario. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question about that uh, stiffness in the back and neck is causing more headaches for me. Do you have any suggestions? Okay, so um, neck, uh, upper, upper back and neck pain and stiffness is common. So are migraines. So they simply may be uh, coexistent, comorbid conditions. Just like you can have anxiety and depression together without one causing the other. Just like you can have diabetes and hypertension and cholesterol and coexisting without one causing the other. You can also have migraines and you can also have neck and upper back tension pain. So they could be separate things which you need to treat separately because if you have a lot of pain in your neck, pain begets pain. That pain can trigger your migraines on and on. But you have to also remember that migraine signals can be felt in the face, around the eyes, and in the neck. So for some people, their migraine headaches, and I'm not sure if you have migraine headaches or just headaches in general, their migraine headaches can start in the neck. So I think we need to optimize uh, acute management. We need to optimize preventive medication if necessary. And for patients with lots of pain in the upper back in between migraine attacks, they may benefit from physiotherapy, um, osteopathic uh, uh, manipulation, trigger point injections, dry needling, and other interventions. Um, going back to the issue of menopause, there's a question that uh, my migraines got worse after menopause. Um, do you have any suggestions to manage my migraines? Yeah, unfortunately, not everybody's migraines go away after menopause. And the suggestion is to see a headache expert, a headache specialist, and uh, treat them as you would treat them and anybody else uh, with, with migraines. So they've persisted, they haven't gone away, but there are treatments, there are effective treatments. Okay. There's a question about uh, sex, the interaction between sexual activity and headaches. Do you have any, there's any connection between the two? Um, so we talked about primary headache disorders, um, and we talked about four categories under primary headache disorders, one of which is migraine, the second is tension headache, the third was called trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia, so cluster headache and company, and the fourth was other primary headaches. One of those is headache associated with sexual activity. There are people who do not suffer from headaches, migraines, or otherwise, who one day during sexual activity either pre-orgasmically pre or as they reach orgasm, will experience a sudden severe headache that stops them in their tracks. And it will happen every time that they are involved with sexual activity, whether by themselves or by a partner. So when this happens for the first time, it is usually a cause for worry and a need to go to the emergency room to check and to have your brain scanned to make sure that you have no underlying serious conditions such as an aneurysm or an arterial venous malformation or some other uh, headache, uh, secondary headache syndrome. Now, if there isn't, and the majority of people do not have a serious underlying cause, then it becomes a primary headache syndrome. And we don't understand exactly why this happens, but it doesn't last forever. That's the good news. And there are certain specific medications used for treatment of, of headache associated with sexual activity that can help you uh, get over this period of time until the headache goes away just as strangely as it started. Very good. Uh, I think for the sake of time, we will take only final question. I mean, I know, I know there are some questions still coming up. Um, uh, is there any differences in approach in patient with migraine with versus patient with migraine without aura? Would you treat them differently? Okay. So um, it depends what is the most distressing feature. Um, if the most distressing feature is the headache, you would treat them pretty much the same. If the most distressing feature is the aura, yeah. so somebody who has migraine with aura once a month, but when the aura happens, uh, uh, they just cannot drive. They, they lose their vision. Their vision becomes very bad, and it stays for half an hour, an hour, and that's not good enough for them. So for that patient, maybe a single migraine attack per month may even be an indication for preventive type therapy. For those patients with migraine with aura, I would definitely, especially women, I would definitely address the issue of smoking and the birth control pill. Um, I will see if there is any uh, uh, association with the menstrual cycle because sometimes we can give medications around menstrual menstruation 
uh, menstrual cycle to reduce these headaches. But in general, treatment guidelines are the same. There are no proven medications that work just for one or the other. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, which unfortunately is not available here, is a very effective non-medicinal way of treating migraine with aura. When you experience the aura, you put this device on the back of your head and you click it a couple of times, you give a magnetic wave and it resets your brain, aborts the aura and prevents the aftercoming headache. So there are some subtle differences, but in general, they're the same guidelines for both. Very good. Um... For the sake of time, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I cannot, we cannot take further questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kaid, for uh, participating with us in this uh, excellent uh, webinar discussion. Uh, I know there are still some questions coming up. I promise that we'll take notes of these questions, and I promise we will address them in the next webinar, which is scheduled in June, and uh, Gerard will tell you more about the next webinar. Thank you very much for all of you for attending this uh, exciting uh, uh, webinar. And I look forward to host uh, you as well in the next one. Uh, Gerard, the floor is yours for your final words. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tafik, and thank you, Dr. Deeb. Um, we've received so many uh, positive comments on the private chats. Um, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, lots of people found it very insightful and many people asking where you are based so they, they can come and visit you. Um, if you want to tell them uh, how they can make an appointment with you. Um, Get your PCR test and come to Dubai. <laughs> I'm located in the Dubai Healthcare City. I, I, have, I work in a private clinic in Dubai Healthcare City as well as uh, at MediClinic City Hospital. These are the two uh, major uh, main places that I work at. Thank you, Dr. D. Um, as I say, we've had a, a number of overwhelming positive today, so thank you very much. And as you touched upon, we have the fifth and final webinar series on June 16th, and that will be on uh, migraines and psychiatric disorders, which is a very important point. So we will be sending out information to all of you that are registered so that you can come and join us on June 16th for that event. Thank you all. Thank you again to Dr. Taufik at the American Center for Hosting this prestigious event, and thank you to Eli Lilly for uh, supporting us in this uh, program. Uh, I wish you all good night and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.